Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. My name is Daniel Belkin, and I'm here with my co-host and brother, Mitch Belkin. We're both medical students interested in non-traditional ideas and innovation. This podcast is our attempt to explore topics currently on the outskirts of medicine, topics not widely accepted by the mainstream, but that we believe merit a closer look. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, follow us on Twitter at exmedpod and sign up for our newsletter at external medicine podcast podcast.com forward slash subscribe. Okay, today we are interviewing Dr. Robert Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is a professor of surgery and the chair of the Department of Surgery at NYU Langone, as well as the director of the NYU Langone Transplant Institute. He received his MD from the University of Rochester and completed his surgical residency, multi-organ transplant fellowship and postdoctoral fellowship in human genetics at Johns Hopkins. He also received a doctorate of philosophy and molecular immunology from the University of Oxford. He's been the recipient of many, many awards, including the Johns Hopkins Clinician Scientist Award and the Terasaki Medical Innovation Award from the National Kidney Registry. Dr. Montgomery developed the first laparoscopic kidney procurement technique for transplantation. He also was the first person to come up with the idea of a domino pair donation. And this is something that that came from a problem, which is when people are donating their organs, sometimes they are not compatible with their intended recipient. So let's say I wanted to give my organ to my dear brother, Daniel, and we were not a match. I could donate my organ to somebody that I don't know in exchange for someone else who I don't know donating an organ to my brother. And that sets up a a nice sort of think of it like an exchange. I'm giving my organ to somebody. uh, Somebody else is giving their organ to someone else. And eventually around this ring, somebody's going to give an organ to my my brother. This, This was a cool technique that helps to solve Um, the problem of incompatibility among donors and intended recipients. In addition to coming up with that, Dr. Montgomery also developed a, or helped develop a protocol combining kidney and bone marrow transplants, which prevents rejection of donor organs in immune incompatible patients. This has actually eliminated the need for immunosuppressive agents altogether in a small number of patients. In September of 2021, he performed the first xenotransplantation of a pig kidney into a deceased human donor. In this conversation recorded on February 4th, 2022, we discussed Dr. Montgomery's background, his personal family history of cardiomyopathy, his interest in immunology and transplantation, the three types of organ rejection and how we manage them. And we also discussed the future of xenotransplantation. One small note, we mention at one point the University of Maryland's Xeno heart transplant into a living recipient. After the recording of this podcast, however, the patient who received that Xeno heart transplant unfortunately died approximately two months after receiving the organ. And now we bring you Dr. Robert Montgomery. And we are here with Dr. Robert Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery. Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. Before we get started, do you have any financial disclosures? Yeah, so um, I think pertinent to what we're going to be discussing here today, I think the only thing to say is that we have received um, research support from Lung Bio, Bio, which is a subsidiary of uh, United Therapeutics um, to support some of the xenotransplant work that uh, we're doing, but um, no um, personal support, you know, to me of, of any kind from, from uh, United Therapeutics. So our first question is, how did you get interested in medicine and transplant surgery in particular? All right. Well, you know, one is often asked that question, and you know it's it's difficult i think to crystallize in a moment but i think you know i've been asked the question enough times that i've really had to 
to think about it, you know, when I was um, 14 years old, um, my dad got sick with um, uh, cardiomyopathy, which is a disease of the muscle of the heart. And, um, you know, at the time we didn't know it, but it turned out to be a genetic disorder that uh, actually I inherited and others in my family. Um, and so he was um, quite ill. He was 50 years old, um, you know, at sort of a formative period in my life. And um, he was in and out of the hospital for about two years before he died. Um, and I would come home from uh, school and go straight to the hospital and, um, and do my homework in his room. And so I think, you know, just being in that setting and watching what was going on and the doctors and how the doctors and the nurses interacted with him. And, um, you know, that, that was a pretty powerful thing. I remember at one point, one of the doctors brought up um, heart transplantation. And um, this was in the mid seventies. And he said to, you know, my dad and my mom that, um, you know, it wasn't very successful and that my dad really wasn't um, a candidate either because um, he was uh, 50 years old and that was too old, if you can believe that at that time. Um, and so, you know, I th think that really stuck in my mind. Up until that point, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was sure I was, would be a veterinarian. And then after his il illness and death, I think, you know, that that desire to, you know, to be a caretaker, uh, uh, a person who, you know, tried to nurse people back to good health, um, you know, transformed from animals, which I spent so much time with, you know, in my younger years, taking care of different animals to humans. So I think that was probably what cast the die, for better or worse. <laughs> so you are currently a transplant surgeon, but in addition to being a transplant surgeon, you've had uh, a number of things that are somewhat unusual. You had the first; you were the first practicing surgeon to receive an implantable cardiac defibrillator in the late '80s, and uh, I understand correctly in. Uh, just a few years ago, you also were the recipient of a heart transplant yourself. Um, yeah. What was surprising to you about those experiences of being on the other side of the uh, uh, the knife, as it were? Yeah. So, um, so what you're referring to was, you know, and I alluded to earlier was that you know this disease that my dad died from at 52. Um, which we thought was a post-viral cardiomyopathy. Um, we discovered when I was an intern um, at Johns Hopkins that that wasn't the case. When my brother, um, who was 35 years old, um, had a sudden death, um, and you know, we it was clear at that point that you know our family had a, a, a real problem, and, and some years later. Um, the gene that, you know, is involved, the mutation of um, a gene that um, splices and assembles the large proteins that are part of uh, the heart muscle um, was the culprit. Um, and that this was something that, you know, each um, uh, of my brothers had a 50-50 chance of inheriting. And then I had a, another brother who had to have a heart transplant when he was 39. So he, he's actually 26 years out from his heart transplant and still doing really well. Um, but um, so, yeah, so um, when I was, uh, you know, an intern um, and then in my second year at Hopkins and had decided, you know, and really threw all of my energy into becoming a surgeon um, that that might not happen because um, when it was clear that I had inherited the disease and was showing signs of having unstable rhythms, um, 
they recommended strongly that I have a defibrillator. And believe it or not, you know, what we call an ICD or implantable defibrillator had just been invented fairly uh, recently um, in the 80s when I uh, was at Hopkins, at Hopkins. And so um, I was in the first 1,000 people to receive a defibrillator, and I was the first surgeon. But, you know, it was kind of touch and go. They didn't really think that having this disease and having a defibrillator was really consistent with being a surgeon or maybe not even a doctor at all. Um, but, you know, I had some people who um, were my mentors who looked out for me and, and I, I had a very clear vision of what, you know, I wanted to do in life. And, and I was pretty darn persistent um, in manifesting that. So it worked out, but, um, you know, it was difficult. So, you know, I was 29 years old then. Um, so I've been a patient really my entire life, almost my adult life anyway. Um, and so, you know, I would say that I, the, these roles as, as doctor and surgeon and, and patient evolved together. Um, and it, it wasn't sort of like suddenly being on the other side it was that I've kind of, you know, for uh, many years had both identities. And um, I mean, I think, you know, to your point, um, it really has shaped how I, uh, you know, I guess you could say my bedside manner, if you will, how, how I interact with patients, because I have a very clear image in my own mind of, you know, the, those individuals who over the years have been my physicians and surgeons who I was, you know, able to relate to. And I thought, you know, provided really compassionate care. And they, they served as my mentors for, you know, how to uh, care for patients in a, in a, in a compassionate way. So um, it was, it was not something I had to think about that much. It was fairly effortless. And then, as you say, and, 2018, um, you know, this disease progressed over the years and, um, and I needed to have a heart transplant pretty urgently. Um, and, you know, that had its own challenges, um, living with a transplant. Um, but um, it's, it's been pretty wonderful, um, uh, you know, on balance. Um, I, I didn't, I never expected to be um, alive now, quite honestly. Um, that just kind of always seemed to be something that, you know, based on our family history, just wasn't going to happen. But uh, was able to leverage a lot of um, technology and new developments, um, you know, like the defibrillator, like some of the um, one particular antiarrhythmic that I was on for a long time that kind of stabilized my heart rhythm. And, and then the um, evolution of transplantation. It's very different now than it was, you know, when it was just brought up um, when my father was in the hospital. Um, it, it's really something now that people can live with and live for many years, like my other brother. So you were at Hopkins for a long time before you moved to NYU, which you did a few years ago. Is that correct? Yeah, I was at Hopkins for um, almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. Did you yeah. ever meet Peter Atia when you were there? Yeah, of course. Peter and I were residents together. Oh, wow. Yeah. What, what was that like? <laughs> oh, he's a great guy. He, he was always, you know, really different. I, I know um, he's taken sort of a different path in his career. Uh, he was always all into whatever he was doing. When, you know, he was a surgical resident, he, he wanted to be the best surgical resident that, you know, you could be. Um, he's a very intense guy, lovable, wonderful uh, character. Yeah, he's our competition. So <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. It's a stiff competition. <laughs> neck and neck. So before we get uh, to the main topic we want to talk about today, which is xenotransplantation, we want to touch briefly on regular transplantation, um, specifically about rejection and 
uh, the main forms of preventing rejection. So as we're taught in medical school, there are three different types of rejection, hyperacute, acute, chronic. How do you go about preventing rejection? And what are the main medication types that are, are used? Yeah, so, um, you know, you, you bring up um, those, those three uh, types of rejection. And, you know, it's interesting because hyperacute rejection is something that we rarely ever see anymore. Um, it's caused by um, antibodies um, and, it, and they're preformed antibodies. Um, so they're antibodies that are sort of waiting, you know, in the recipient's bloodstream for the new organ um, to arrive, and then they immediately attack it. And generally, within minutes or hours, the organ is destroyed by these antibodies. Um, we, we don't see it because we do something called a cross-match before, which tests for those antibodies. And then if, um, if they're there, we, we don't do the transplant. Um, However, you know, there are people who have those antibodies to just about everybody in the population. And so I've spent most of my career actually trying to tackle that problem. Um, it's called sensitization. And, you know, it's um, as a result of people having had previous exposure to someone else's tissue um, because of pregnancy, blood transfusions, or previous transplant, they develop these antibodies. And that is what is the biggest problem in xenotransplantation too, because um, you know, in, in the case of xenotransplantation, those antibodies are directed against a sugar molecule um, that has been lost during evolution between pig and humans. And so um, the pig's organs are completely you know, um, uh, covered with this sugar molecule of the cells in, in, in those tissues. And about 1% of our total antibodies are directed against that sugar molecule. You might ask, why would that, you know, why would that be the case? And it, we think it's um, because um, it's a cross reactivity um, of those antibodies um, that uh, are very, the, the target of the antibody is very similar between the um, surface of a bacteria and um, the sugar that is expressed in animals um, on their cells. And, you know, we have bacteria in our GI tract that we have to constantly have a barrier, you know, to prevent that bacteria from getting into our blood and making us ill. But it's, re, you know, it's, it's absolutely necessary, the microbiome in our colon to uh, normal uh, GI um, function. Um, but there's, again, we d develop these, these really strong antibodies um, that then cross react with the sugar in pig tissue. And, and that's what causes the hyperacute rejection when you try to uh, transplant a pig organ into a human. And that is the, the, that main sugar is the main target of the genetic modifications that you know are are being made in um, pigs to prevent the expression of that sugar on the surface of the cells. So I've spent really you know again most of my career dealing with this problem between um, people who are sensitized to other humans' organs and now people who are sensitized you know, to pig organs. And, um, you know, again, you could just avoid doing those transplants, but that means then that those humans who are sensitized can never get another human organ, or you could just not do xenotransplantation because of that risk of hyperacute rejection. But, you know, we've sort of gotten around that with the genetic modifications that we're making. Um, and then, you know, the acute and the acute type of rejection, which kind of has two flavors as well, cellular and antibody, we, we handle that very well. That's hardly even a problem anymore. Um, chronic rejection, though, is what results in about 40 to 50% of um, transplants failing long term. We don't have a good handle on that. So we've become really successful at, pe at getting people out to a year after a transplant. Like if you, if I do a kidney transplant on you, there's about a 97% chance at the end of the first year, 
you'll be alive well and have a functioning kidney transplant. But at the end of 10 years, it's more like, you know, 50%. So we're still, you know, really, I think, challenged by the long-term outcomes of transplants. And a, one of the big problems in the long-term outcomes are, is chronic rejection. You mentioned that acute rejection is um, less and less of an issue. Is that due to the use of particular types of medications? And if so, what, what medications are the mainstay of preventing acute organ rejection? Yeah, it's, it's exactly because of that. Um, we've developed really good um, medications for maintenance therapy and also for what we call induction therapy, which is sort of the kickstart, you know, the transplant process to kind of right, right off the bat, kind of block the, the um, immune system, um, the immune system's response to the new organ. Um, and so there's, you know, a, a host of different drugs, two main ones that we use for what I refer to as induction therapy, which, you know, is, is, is really targeted against T, T cells. T cells are, um, you know, cells that are very involved in initiating an immune response. Um, they also are effector cells, so they can, you know, uh, kill other cells them, themselves, but they also give messages to other types of cells that will then get engaged in a rejection type of response. So it's important to just kind of knock those down right away. And so there's one type of drug that actually depletes, it actually kills your T cells and really depletes them that we give right at the time of the transplant. And then the alternative, which is a bit milder, is a drug that um, blocks IL-2 which is a, a cytokine, uh, it's sort of a, a message, um, if you will, that T cells give to other cells to activate. And, um, and then there's three main drugs that, are, that make up the sort of maintenance immunosuppression. One's called a calcineurin inhibitor, and the most common one now is, is a drug called tacrolimus, or Prograf uh, is the other name for it. Um, before that, it was cyclosporin, um, those two work uh, very, in a very similar way, uh, but Prograf is a bit more effective. Uh, and then uh, what's called an anti-metabolite. So a, a drug that just sort of um, uh, prevents cells from dividing rapidly, um, that's called Cellcept um, or mycophenolate. It's the other name for it. And then steroids, uh, old-fashioned drug at least in kidney transplantation, we keep people on a small dose of uh, steroids. Those drugs are very effective at preventing acute rejection. And we see acute rejection in single digits now. So, you know, less than 10%. It's, and if somebody gets it, it doesn't mean they're going to lose the organ. It just means you have to give them um, some stronger drugs to turn that around. And it's usually not a problem. Hmm. So how did you get interested in xenotransplantation? And I guess also, why use organs from other species? Why not just use human organs? Well, I mean, the problem, the second part of your question, uh, the problem is we don't have enough. So there aren't enough people every year who die in a way that, you know, would allow them to um, donate organs. And of the, those types of deaths, um, there, there aren't a, enough people who then, you know, are organ donors. Um, so, you know, not, a, not everyone who could potentially be an organ donor donates organs, obviously, we know that. Um, and that, you know, those numbers haven't changed that much. We've seen a bit of an increase, 20 to 30% increase in the number of donors um, in the past seven or eight years, but unfortunately, that increase has been the result of the opioid epidemic, which hopefully with all the attention that that's getting and, you know, the investment, you know, in research and so on that will eventually, uh, you know, change that math and, um, and find ways 
to prevent, you know, overdoses from happening. And, and so, you know, I think e even with what we currently are able to, you know, optimize in terms of um, organ donation, we're still only able to supply um, about, you know, 20, 20 to 30 percent of the organs that are needed each year. And so as a result, more than half of the people who are waiting for a transplant never receive one because they either get too ill or die before. So that's the problem. Um, human organs for transplantation are great. It works. And um, people have a better quality of life. On average, you know, for a kidney transplant, people live twice as long with a transplant than they do if they stay on dialysis and they have a much better quality of life and, and it's much cheaper for the healthcare system to um, support somebody with a transplant versus keeping them on dialysis. So it's a win-win, you know, across the board, but we don't have enough organs. So that's where xenotransplantation comes in. And it's not just to fill the gap, you know, of people who are waiting versus the organs that are available, which that gap is, is increasing every year. So the, the growth in the need is almost exponential. And, and the growth in the supply, if it weren't for the opioid epidemic, it would be pretty flat. But um, it's not a, you know, we hope that won't be sustained. And, and even with doing everything that we've done to try to increase donation, we still, that math, you know, the paradigm is still failing. Um, and so xenotransplantation, in my mind, fills that gap. Not only that, I think it would allow people who currently are not even considered to be candidates for transplantation to potentially receive a transplant. So right now there's 800,000 people who have uh, um, CKD, chronic kidney disease stage five, in the United States. And we only list um, about 90,000 of those people. If we had an unlimited supply of organs, a renewable supply of organs, I believe that we would tr be transplanting more of that 800,000 um, group. So that's where that comes in. As far as my role, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've spent my whole career looking at incompatibilities between two you know, individuals to humans um, and people who are sensitized and can't receive organs um, from other people because they've previously been exposed to human tissue um, and also blood type incompatibilities. I've done a lot of work in getting around those incompatibilities. Um, and it's kind of the same problem as we face in xenotransplantation. As I mentioned earlier, it's just different targets for the, the immune system, but it's the same kind of problem. So um, the, the, the xenotransplant community has always been interested in the things that we were doing to overcome um, incompatibilities between um, humans, um, because those same techniques and drugs and um, modalities, you know, were things that were needed for xenotransplantation. So, you know, really since the 90s, I've been attending xeno meetings, lecturing, sharing my ideas. Um, and then as this, you know, kind of evolved um, and we started to get closer to the human application, um, you know, that's where I think my skills really, it requires a different skill set. You know, the, the genetic engineering is a different skill set. The carrying out experiments in animals and, and primates and that sort of thing, all these things that set this up, different people, different skill set. Now we're sort of like, I mean, I kind of think of it as like, now we're like, this is the, this, this is the Apollo program. And like who now, you know, is ready to actually do this? And, that, and actually when they started the, the Gemini and Apollo program, they faced the same question like, okay, 
you know, who would be the best astronauts, right? And it ended up being fighter pilots, right? It ended up being test pilots. Um, and I think, you know, again, the skill set that's most applicable to bringing all the stuff that's been done before now in preclinical models to humans are people who are used to taking care of humans who have overactive immune systems and are, you know, uh, sort of poised to respond to other humans. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of how, that, that's where my background has sort of um, aligned and converged on this kind of moment in time. You mentioned the goal of xenotransplantation is to have an unlimited slash renewable supply of organs. And you also mentioned the uh, the sugar moiety, the uh, alpha gal that was knocked out of the pig transplant that you used in your um, xenotransplant procedures. I have a question about like where do these pigs come from and how are they raised? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, they're 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 raised in a, a specialized facility, um, you know, farm um, that has you know, uh, like a a strategy for um, preventing the herd from be, being becoming infected with um, different um, pathogens, you know, and and so it's it's you know a, a lot of it is sort of like an operating room in a way it's it's extremely sterile and clean um and the idea is to you know maintain the the animals um in a way that keeps them pathogen free so they can be used um for human transplantation and um so it's it's a you know it, it's a a facility that um has been around for a long time, had tremendous amount of investment, you know, a lot of um, uh, care and thought was put into how to create that. They, they manage the animals in a very humane way. They give them lots of activities, you know, play and things like that. So that kind of the pigs live their best lives. Um, like in comparison to pigs that are, um, you know, headed towards the slaughterhouse it's a really different kind of existence um and um and again you know it's it's all about just being very careful about not you know having the animals um infected with uh microbes that could be transferred to humans i'm glad you brought up the microbes potentially infectious to humans, because that's what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I know that in the 1960s, one of the major concerns in the research community was about simian virus number 40, which was a rhesus monkey virus that was discovered to have infected between like 10 and 30% of the polio vaccines in the US in 1960. And those viruses were later found to be a cause for sarcomas and ependymomas in animal models, but fortunately not in humans. Can you tell us a little bit about porcine endogenous viruses and how exactly animals are prevented from transfecting, transmitting those to their uh, human recipients? Yeah, so you know th this this is all about you know this field of zoonosis or you know the transmission of. Um, uh, usually viruses, um, but, you know, pathogens from animals to humans. And, you know, there are some very unfortunate examples of this, right? I mean, we're living through one now, potentially. Um, and um, certainly HIV, you know, is probably a, another example. We think that probably came from the primate world. And, you know, one of the concerns, because there's been um, different sort of eras of thinking, you know, about xenotransplantation. And for a while, like in the 1960s and 70s, that the, the era that you referred to, um, you know, there were some uh, examples of, of primate organs that were transplanted into humans, baby phase. 
probably the most famous the baboon heart that was transplanted into a child. Um, and you know, one of the risks of of using um, uh, baboons or or monkeys as donors um, is that they're close enough to humans that probably um, the pathogens are more transmissible. Well, well, they are. We know that. And you know um, that plus the scarcity of primates and the general um, poor public perception um, really, I think, you know, took the field down a different road and, and toward pigs as, as the donors. Um, people have lived closely with pigs, you know, for centuries. Um, we, you know, uh, use them as a food source, um, source of heart valves, different pharmaceuticals, insulin, you know, many things come from pigs. There's been about 200 people who have had pig tissue, um, stem cells, um, skin grafts, um, who have been studied very closely and uh, there's been no transmission of um, pathogens in those folks. But the one that you um, speak of, the porcine endogenous virus, the, the sort of uh, unfortunate word that that we use uh, is PERV to short, as a, a short version um, is the one that we're most uh, concerned about. And um, the, the PERV uh, viral um, DNA is, you know, inserted in the pig uh, genome, um, which is often the case with endogenous viruses. It's just sort of sitting there at a lot of different sites in the over 40 sites in the pig genome. Um, and, you know, in one experiment that was done where um, pig cells were co cultured with transformed, you know, cancerous, if you will, um, human cells that were uh, proliferating at a very rapid rate, as transformed cells do, um, there, there was you know, evidence that that, uh, that um, virus could be transmitted. Um, but again, in, in the real world, um, in cases where humans have received, you know, pig tissue, um, that's never been the case. And um, it, it caused great concern. I would say the two greatest concerns that we've had in xenotransplantation over the years was hyperacute rejection from alpha gal and perv, um, you know, which uh, is is something that I think really uh, in the 1990s brought the field to the point of extinction, if you will. Um, but I think you know studies that were done looking at individuals who had received pig tissue uh, uh, transplants and a lot more bench type research on porcine endogenous virus has given us a lot of confidence that it's, it's probably the risk is extremely low, but we still have to be very careful. And for instance, when we did our um, research, we um, uh, did really close surveillance for the transmission of PERV in our um, decedent recipients and also um, we did surveillance on the healthcare workers who were involved in the study. And that'll be the case as we move forward um, in, you know, living humans. So in the last six months or so, you've done a few xenotransplants in humans with using pig kidneys, and there was just a heart xenotransplant done at University of Maryland. I'm curious, you know, looking forward over the next couple of years, what do you see as the biggest technical and regulatory barriers to continuing moving forward with xenotransplantation in humans? You know, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, th that we, you know, we're sort of victim of, uh, of our own success. And as much as, you know, uh, human transplantation has evolved to a point where it's so successful, at least in the short and medium term, 
that trying to compare it to anything else, you know, is a high bar, right? So introducing any other kind of source of organs, you know, it is challenging because um, we're so successful at uh, using uh, human organs. But the problem is, as we spoke about earlier, there just aren't enough of those. And so people are dying every day, 17 people a day waiting. And um, so, you know, I think that is, you know, always kind of what we have to struggle with is, you know, in, in moving towards phase one trials, like what, what do we consider to be a reasonable endpoint, you know, for the success of these organs? Because we can't be in a situation, um, you know, in uh, the medical sciences where we can't make any forward progress um, because we put, you know, these very kind of unreasonable high bars, um, you know, so that um, we're paralyzed um, by, you know, the challenge of introducing any new technology, um, it, you know, when we're, we're not sort of given the opportunity to try to develop it. And, it, you know, even if it looks promising and like will exceed what we currently have, it's still, you know, a challenging environment. Uh, I think that, you know, um, Tom Starzl, who was the first person to do a liver transplant, um, if, if, if he were trying to do that currently, because he had many cases that failed before he had success, I think probably he would struggle to, um, to be able to get the regulatory permission to move forward. And so, you know, it's a different world for sure. Um, and, and we're all, you know, who are involved in xenotransplantation, really working very hard to try to um, do all the preclinical primate work. And, you know, and now we found this other pathway um, in, in terms of uh, testing some of um, these organs in people who have died, um, but are maintained on a ventilator and their family have, has essentially donated their body to, um, to be involved in a study looking at, uh, you know, how, how effective our drugs are and our um, genetic modif modifications of the pig organs in, in producing a good outcome. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really that um, just showing efficacy um, that is reasonable that, you know, and what is that? Like, you know, we have uh, pig organs and primates now that um, are functioning, um, you know, out to almost two years. Is that enough? I mean, you know, the average human kidney lasts a lot longer than that. Um, but it's really hard to take care of primates and to really, you know, they are much more susceptible to infections. Um, they, anytime you have to draw their blood or whatever, you have to give them an anesthetic. It's really different than humans who are a lot easier to care for. Um, and so, you know, we found this sort of intermediate um, position somewhere between the animal studies and living humans, you know, where it's hard to uh, do harm because the person's already dead, um, where we can test, you know, I, I think further, like what is the human response and how translatable is what we found in primates to humans, because humans are not exactly like monkeys and things that, you know, seem where well, there's plenty of examples of things that look very promising in primates that didn't work in humans. And so, um, you know, I think we found that kind of niche um, to look at some of this. And then the University of Maryland group sort of leapfrogged and went straight to um, a, uh, you know, a uh, emergency use uh, IND um, for um, a living human. And of course, you know, all eyes are on that study now. Um, but I think, you know, what's probably going to happen over the next year or two is um, we're accumulating more and more information. We've sort of broken the ice, you know, now this has now been tested in humans for the first time. Um, and between that human data and the and ongoing primate data, I think we're getting much more rapidly than we would have had we not done some of these recent cases toward a phase one trial or several phase one trials. 
um, in kidney and heart, because those are the two organs that we're most advanced in currently. So last question before we move on to a couple really quick rapid fire ones. What role do you see for 3D printed bioartificial organs in the future of transplantation surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and I think like, you know, I, I always think of like what we're doing now as, as sort of fossil fuel. Like, you know, we're, we, we, we've tried to optimize the number of organs from humans that are available. We've made it uh, in a way, um, you know, better, more efficient. We, we've developed a lot of thing, infrastructure to support it and so on, but it's never going to uh, really be sustainable. And I think of uh, bioartificial organs and xenotransplantation as sort of the wind and the solar of the future. You know, these are, this is the possibility to have an unlimited supply of organs. There was a time, I think, when most people were putting their money on bioartificial organs, but in, in 3D printing is one way to achieve you know, a scaffolding that you put um, stem cells on, you know, and create these organs. Um, but now I think, you know, um, again, with the study that we did in um, September 25th, it sort of, you know, I think created this growth edge that now is rapidly um, extending. And um, I think Xeno is going to really, you know, where we biology's already created the organ, right? Um, and it, we just have to figure out how to fake out the human immune system to think that it's a human organ. Um, whereas bioartificial organs, you know, you've got to recreate biology in a sense. Um, I think it's, it's closer, Xeno is closer, but we're working um, also, you know, with United Therapeutics uh, on bioartificial organs. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and I think we can also test them, you know, in the recently deceased in the same way that we're testing uh, Xeno organs. Um, and someday I think there, they will be um, another source of organs um, for, for humans. And now for a couple rapid fire questions. The first one, what important medical truth do very few of your colleagues agree with you on? I think, you know, it, it, as far as um, xenotransplantation, they believe that, um, that the idea of like more and more uh, genetic modifications is going to solve this. And I think that um, less is more. I, I think that the, the, the reason why is that, again, the people who have been driving the field are are people who are taking care of patients on a regular basis. We've got a whole array of drugs that do the same thing as those genetic modifications. So we're going with a simpler organ, but there's still a lot of skeptics who think that, you know, it's not going to work, um, that you need these big payload, these big genetic payloads dropped into the pig genome in order to solve the problem. What important development in transplantation or immunology research should more doctors outside the field be aware of? I think there's been some, you know, really interesting developments in tolerance um, where using um, bone marrow um, from the donor and getting that bone marrow to engraft in the recipient um, either permanently or for some period of time, along with a solid organ transplant, has been able to allow that person to come off um, immunosuppression completely. And as somebody who takes immunosuppression every day, believe me, there are a lot of side effects and there are long-term problems that are associated with taking immunosuppression. And so I think very few people have a, a really good understanding that that is something that has been done successfully. And there are about 50 people walking around right now who are completely tolerant to their transplant and are completely off immunosuppression. Wow, I had no idea. Um, and the last question, you are married to an opera singer. What's your favorite opera and why? Well, of course, I'd have to say Carmen, um, because that's 
where she spent a lot of her career um, uh, uh, doing Carmen um, in opera houses throughout the world. Um, and, you know, it's just a great story. Um, it's got everything in it. Um, and, you know, the music is, is immediately accessible to people. So I didn't grow up, you know, in a, a home uh, where we had an appreciation for opera. Uh, in fact, when I met my wife, she asked me if I knew opera. And I said, only from uh, uh, my experience with uh, watching Bugs Bunny which she wasn't that impressed with, but, um, you know, so, so I, I never really developed an, an ear for opera. Now I love it, of course, um, because I think it's something that you, you, you know, you may, if you were, you're not exposed to it when you're young, you may never be. And, um, and I think it's something that is, uh, like many good things in life. It's a learned appreciation, but, uh, Carmen is so accessible and it's, you, you, you just want to tap your foot, you know? So I'm kind of a rock and roller and, you know, I, I kind of really do, um, have a great appreciation for music and an understanding, a good ear for music. At least that's what my wife says. And, um, but, um, you know, you have to kind of curate your appreciation for opera. But if, if, if you were to ask me, like, if, if I'm like, I've never been to an opera, what should I what's my, my entry level opera drug? I would say Carmen is a great one because it's a great story. Music is spectacular. It's, it's like I said, it's very accessible, um, great beats and uh, melodies. And um, so that's a good one. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. For anyone who is interested in learning more about you and your work, is there any internet site that you want them to, uh, that you think that they should check out or where can they find you on the internet? Well, if, they, if you just Google my name, it'll, I'm sure you can go down lots of rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank we you really again. Appreciate it. If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 